Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Asha Vagware. I'm student of MA European Studies at Mahe. And uh, I'm very honored to welcome all of you for the afternoon session. The afternoon session theme is titled as What we talk about when we talk about the Northeast. Our moderator for the day would be Mr. Roman Laishram, and the guest speakers are Patricia Mukhim, Mitra Fukan, and Mr. Prasanjit Biswas. To introduce you a bit about Mr. Roman Laishram, Mr. Roman is a writer, a content professional, stylist, diversity and inclusion trainer. He is also an activist and journalist from Bangalore, who also dabbles in theater, dance, and music. Currently, the head of content and corporate communications at Fresh Menu in Bangalore. He's also well known as an LGBTQIA activist. He's the founder of the Queer Arts Movement India and Rainbow Kitty, a public figure funding initiative for the LGBTQIA community. He's also an active member of Northeast Solidarity, a collective that works at enabling marginalized Northeastern diaspora in Bangalore. He has also been a lifestyle journalist for over a decade with more than 10 years of experience in the fields of lifestyle reportage and publishing. He has previously worked with Arvind Limited in Ahmedabad and Bangalore, then HRLN, which is the Human Rights Law Network in Delhi, Mumbai, and Bangalore, and then CRY in, Bangalore, in Mumbai as well, Queer Inc., an online LGBTQIA+ publishing house in Mumbai, and with various mainstream publications, which also includes Bangalore Mirror. I welcome the guest speakers and our moderator for the session with a huge round of applause. Good afternoon, and welcome to this panel on <clears throat> Northeastern literature. Uh, before we get into the panel, I think it's really important that I introduce my three distinguished uh, <clears throat> panel members. While I'm going to try and make this really brief, they've all done so much in their life, it's not going to be very brief, so please bear with me as I introduce them. First of all, Mitra Pukan. Mitra Pukan is a writer, translator, columnist, and a trained classical vocalist who lives in Guwahati, Assam. Her published literary works include four children's books, a biography and two novels, The Collector's Wife and A Monsoon of Music, both published by Penguin Zuban, and a collection of 50 of her columns, Guwahati Gaze. Her most recent works are a translation of the Nyanpeet Awardi Birendra Kumar Bhattacharjee's novel, Kobor or Pool, Blossoms in the Graveyard, Neogi Publications, and a collection of her own short stories, A Full Night's Thievery, Speaking Tiger, both of which appeared in October 2016. Her short stories have appeared in various journals worldwide. Her works have been translated into many languages. As a translator herself, she has put across the works of some of the best known contemporary writers of fiction in Ahomia into English. She writes widely on music, both as a reviewer and as a fiction writer. Her column, All Things Considered, in the Assam Tribune is very widely read. A big round of applause for Mitra Kukan, please. Our second panelist, Prasenjit Biswas, is currently an associate professor of philosophy at the Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. Besides, he has taught philosophy at Indian School of Mines, Dhanbad, Indian Institute of Philosophy, Mumbai and Guwahati, Assam University, Silchar. He specializes in phenomenology and continental philosophy, philosophy of Northeast India, ethno-philosophy, philosophy of science, political philosophy, and many other such fields. He has published books like Ethnic Life Worlds in Northeast India, Political Economy of Ended Up Underdevelopment of Northeast India, Construction of Evil in Northeast India, The Postmodern Controversy, The Meaning, Metaphor, and Method of Peace in Northeast India, Between Philosophy and Anthropology, Aporias of Language, Thought, and Consciousness. He has published many papers in edited books and journals. Apart from academic works, he also is a leading human rights activist from Northeast India. He has worked for ensuring compensation paid to families of members who died of hunger at Assam's Bhuban Valley Tea Garden issue in 2011-2012. He currently chairs Barak Human Rights Protection Committee, Silchar. He has been writing regularly on the Northeast page of Statesman, New Delhi, and Kolkata. 
He has visited in various assignments to the universities of Cambridge, Wayne State University, Detroit, University of South Florida, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Rabindra Bharati University, Delhi University, and other leading universities abroad and in India. He has been a ready speaker on issues of contemporary social theory and issues of human rights to a variety of audiences across the world and in the international media such as Al Jazeera, Voice of America, South China, Morning Times, etc. A big round of applause for him, please. Our last panelist for this, uh, this afternoon session, but definitely not the least, is Patricia Mary Mukhim. She is an Indian social activist, writer, journalist, and the editor of Shillong Times, known for her social activism and her writings on mining in Meghalaya and the Khasi people of the state. She also contributes articles to other publications such as The Statesman, The Telegraph, Eastern Panorama, and The Northeastern Times. A recipient of honors such as Chameli Devi Jain Award, One India Award, Federation of India Chambers of Commerce and Industry FLO Award, Upendranath Brahma Soldier of Humanity Award, Shiva Prasad Barua National Award, and Northeast Excellence Award, she was honored by the Government of India in 2000 with the fourth highest Indian Civilian Award of Padma Shri. She is the founder of Shillong We Care, a non governmental organization involved in the fight against militancy in Meghalaya. She is a member of the National Security Advisory Board of the Government of India and serves as a member of the National Foundation for Communal Harmony under the Ministry of Home Affairs India. Mukhim is the director of Indigenous Women's Resource Center Shillong, a trustee of the Center of Northeast Studies and Policy Research, CNES, and the vice president of Indo Global Service Society. She's on the board of Women's Regional Network, a cross-border women's forum involving women from the Indian subcontinent. A huge round of applause for her. And with that, we'll start our panel. Um, before that, we're going to play a small little game. And um, I mean, I'd like the volunteers to remember who answers each of these questions, because I'd like to give them something at the end, maybe sometime later. <laughs> OK, I'm going to name a few towns from across the Northeast. And I want to know if any of you all will know which states these towns come from. OK? The more, the better. Um, a town called Moray. Anyone knows where it is? Anyone? OK, Moray is the biggest uh, business town through which almost all Indo-Myanmar trade happens. It's on the border of Myanmar and India, or in the state of Manipur. And technically, everything that you get in India, which has come through China, if it's not officially shipped to India, it comes through the roadways and it comes through Moray. So it's a really, really important town, because most of you all have something from China with you, I'm sure, a pen or a camera or something. And it's come through Moray. OK, another town called Dorky. Anyone's heard of it? Anyone, Dorky? OK, Dorky is a beautiful town that I'm pretty sure you'll have seen pictures of. Facebook would have given you pictures of this place. It's this river on the border of Meghalaya and Bangladesh with absolutely clear water, where you can see this, the, literally see the bottom of the river. And it's, it's on a river that uh, borders Meghalaya from Bangladesh. And it's literally one of the most beautiful places on earth that you should definitely visit. OK, Tawang. Come on. <laughs> Everyone's heard of Tawang. OK, Tawang is pretty popular. Sipsagar. Anyone? Where is it? But you're, you're, you're from there, aren't you? <laughs> She's from there. <laughs> OK. Um, when I say Kamrup, what do you think I'm referring to? Is it an actual place, or is it? It's a part of Assam. It's a geography within Assam. OK, anyway, the whole idea of playing this game, and I hope volunteers remember that one person who answered. <laughs> The idea is to tell you about how absolutely clueless mainland India is about the Northeast, right? For most of us Northeasterners who have a connection to that place, these are places that all of us know. Like when we were discussing about these towns, everyone here on the panel knew about these towns. Because in the Northeast, we're aware of most of the seven sisters. And if we can call Sikkim the eighth sister, then so be it. Yeah, Sikkim. The only brother. Sikkim's a brother. <laughs> so um, we have seven sisters and one brother. And we're pretty aware of the places in and around the Northeast. But how aware is India about the Northeast? And this is a question that I put to the audience. You know, People keep saying, why are Northeasterners treated so differently? Why do Northeasterners feel so different? The answer is very much here. Because if I was asking you towns from anywhere across mainland India, I would have seen many, many more hands go up. But because this was about the Northeast, very few people care, or very few people even want, like no, nobody really takes the effort to figure out what's happening up there. It's, it's one remote corner of the country, and nobody really cares. So the othering, which is something that we're going to be talking about a lot today, starts from within mainland India. So we're first going to talk about experiences of Northeasterners 
when they come into mainland India, how mainland India others them. So the othering of mainland India, I'll give the panelists a chance to speak on their experiences on this and then we will move on to the next topic. Thank you. Uh, yes, first of all, of course, this, uh, it is called the Northeast. But for us who live there, it is not the Northeast. It is where we are, it's the center. How is, the, is it the Northeast? But it is a geographical and we are called, you know, not in a derogatory way, but maybe as a way of convenience, we are called the periphery. And there are uh, titles like the periphery strikes back and all that, and then you realize they are, you're there talking about us, okay. Um, but yes, I don't blame anybody. I think perhaps because it is a geographical construct, uh, it is India's Northeast. When I write, I prefer to say it's India's Northeast, which is true, it is. Uh, geographically, uh, yeah, because the Northeast is of uh, seven sisters and one brother. It is 220 tribes, two, two, 220 ethnic groups with language, custom, uh, textiles, and textiles have their own language. So, and the, uh, the designs, the patterns with different languages on those, cuisine, so many things, cultural aspects. Um, so it is not, I would like to say, a monolithic thing at all, at all. Uh, but I do understand the convenience of it. And I would like to add here that I don't really blame because till the other day, people from my area would call anybody south of the Vindyas a Madrasi. Okay? Oh, he's Madrasi. But now they know when I'm coming to Manipal, they know I'm not going to Madras. So that's an improvement. And then uh, if you were a North Indian, then they would say, oh, she's, he's married a Punjabi girl, when actually she was from Lucknow. <laughs> so, so, you know, those things, I will not say it's typical only. I mean, I, perhaps it's an Indian mindset or what is it? I don't know. We are also to blame in many ways. And as for my own personal experiences, I would like to say that, um, you know, people from the Northeast, India's Northeast, uh, in a very derogatory way, they're called chinky, okay, which we all know about. I have been said, uh, you know, I have been asked, said that, oh, oh, you're from Bengal, you're from uh, uh, Nepal, you're from so many other places, you're from Mexico even, I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then when I say, but I'm from Assam, oh, Assam, that's Northeast, but you're not chinky, you don't look chinky. So that is a very loaded thing. That's my experience, okay? Uh, they mean it, I don't know how they mean it. Uh, but is it good, bad, what, the whole thing is there. So that I find is gradually coming down. They are not saying that, they know. And another aspect that, because I wear mekla sador when I come out. Previously, see even about 15, 20 years ago, they would say, oh, how do you wear your sari like that? But now the good thing is that many people come up to me, women, and they say, you know, we also own a Mekhila Sador like this. So there is integration happening, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, thanks uh, to the moderator. And the question that he posed is of immense importance, part of which it is decoded by Mitra just now. Uh, more importantly, what I would like to point out is that Northeast is very diverse, multicultural, multilingual. But as India is so, Northeast is doubly so in the sense that the communities who live in Northeast, they have such wide range of diversity. Let me give you an example to uh, say what I mean. Uh, Nagas, who are supposed to inhabit uh, the Indian state of uh, Nagaland, and where I grew up as a child, uh, Nagas have almost 34 and occasionally they would say 56 sub-tribes within them and 22 of them are listed by uh, various ethnographers such as Hemindroff and rest of it are not even mentioned. They don't find a mention in the ethnographic texts but in their own oral discourses as they identify themselves, as they draw various kinds of social boundaries, they use their local names in order to designate themselves. There is a kind of self-definition which is full of plurality and multiplicity, 
which cannot be captured by a generic term such as Naga or Mizo or Kasi or Homia. And, and that's the nature of diversity, a diversity uncaptured, not fully revealed, and at the same time experientially so true. And this is the range of diversity that we have in India's Northeast. I speak Bengali and a certain dialect of Bengali being located in southern part of Assam with a kind of a strange history by which in the case of partition it happened only in my area. My, a large part of my district, which is called Silet District, was given up by a kind of an arbitrary referendum, history of which is very peculiar. And people who sort of moved from one part of Silet District to another part of Silet District are now othered. Many of them are termed as foreigners because they speak my language, which is Bangla. So there is this internal othering process within the Northeast as well. So there are multiple other rings as, as there are multiple kinds of diversities. Multiple diversities lead to multiple types and kinds of other rings. So other ring is not simple. It's a pretty complex kind of exclusion, expulsion, as well as a kind of an inclusion which also excludes, a kind of exclusion which also includes. So therefore, you can't define it in terms of an inclusion-exclusion dynamics as we understand diversity in other contexts. Let me come to the topic of the day, which is what do you speak about when you speak about the Northeast? Uh, for those of us who write from the region, it's a great need to be heard. You know, it's, a, it's almost like a psychological craving for the rest of the country to understand us because there's this huge sense of alienation. And to speak about that region is, is, a, is a tall order because it's like a country within a country. You know, it's the, this whole idea of nation hasn't uh, gone down with us very well. We don't really understand the idea of being Indian, but we're very familiar with the idea of being, I'm from the Khasi tribe, so I'm a Khasi. And if you come to Meghalaya, if you come to Shillong, you will see graffiti saying, Khasi by birth, Indian by accident. So you have to negotiate these, you know, these uh, dichotomies. And uh, so when you, you think that uh, there's a huge victimhood syndrome in that region because of which you feel less Indian or not exactly mainstreamed, although you don't want to be mainstreamed. So you, you're negotiating all kinds of identities. And in all of that, you would think that it's a one-way, you know, it's, it's a one-way passage. But it's also not true because when you come to the region, you realize that the out, or the, rather the outsider who comes in realizes that the othering is very complete. You know, if uh, people from the rest of India call us chinkies or whatever, we have a name, you know, every tribe has a name for the outsider. And we use that name in a very pejorative way. So, I mean, <laughs> this is a constant tussle that we have. We don't know how long this will go on, but certainly uh, India is a struggling nation state. And uh, when I listened to Ranjit this, uh, in, in the morning session, I so related to what he said when he said that this idea of nation can really other a lot of people who don't fit into that nation mold. Um, so uh, when you come to that region, you, some of you will sense xenophobia, hatred. In Meghalaya, the state where I come from, we had this whole ethnic cleansing episode beginning 1979. Then it went on to 1987, then 1992. And that's part of our history. But when you remind people of that part of our history, they don't like it. They just want to put it behind them. They just want to, you know, especially with the millennials, you know, people born after 84 or 92. They just don't like that part of history. But how do you forget history 
and then will you not repeat it if you forget it so uh, also when you when you critique your own people when you critique the collective behavior then you're attacked you know you may be one of the community but you will be attacked and uh, that's how somebody threw a petrol bomb at my house on the 17th of april this year just because i said that you know khasi nationalism is not everything there are several forms of nationalism and if that nationalism is 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 manifested by violence and bloodshed and all that then it's no nationalism and there's no point taking the whole uh, community in that you cannot take the whole community get violent and then say that this is our form of nationalism so these are the complexities of the region and we'll speak about that some more thank you patricia that's leading us into our next round of um, uh, things that we're going to be talking about um uh, the first half of this session is going to be slightly political and it's important that it gets political because a lot of the writing in the Northeast does reflect this complex political scenario that is within the Northeast. So uh, we will talk about literature towards the second hour of this session. It's not like we're not going to talk about it, but to give you an idea of where this literature comes from, where it is rooted in, it's important for you to, ki to kind of give you an idea of where different parts of the Northeast stand at right now. Um, the second question that I'm going to pose to the panelists is the second form of othering, which has already been spoken about a little bit. Um, a lot of the Northeast also others everyone else. Um, like, for example, I know I'm Mete myself, and I'm, I, I don't know if a lot of you know, so Ahomia, a term that we've been using, is basically the more uh, correct form of the term Assamese. So every time we say Ahom, Ahomia, we're talking about Assam or Assam, Assamese. Uh, Meite is the correct term for uh, the valley people who live in Manipur. Often it's, often it's often called Manipuri, but that's a terrible term to use because it doesn't uh, represent everyone in that state. So when I say Meite, I'm just talking about the valley people who live in Manipur. Um, so the Meite community, which I'm a part of, um, has this term called Mayang, which is a term used to anyone who is not Meite. And sometimes it's used for also people within the Meite community who look different. And the term itself means strange face. Mayang means strange face. And it's a term that's been used by the community to differentiate themselves from everyone else around them. And these are the terms that exist within almost every community. And I'd like our panelists to sh I mean, shine a little bit more light on that. Yes, of course, unfortunately, uh, we all have words which are very derogatory, which perhaps did not begin in a derogatory way. Because uh, in Assamese, in Okhomia, we have bohiragoto, which is outsider. Outsider is an innocuous word in itself, but the way it's said, and it, it began about, you know, with this Assam movement, when it was a normal thing, now it has become a loaded word, bohiragoto, and go away. Why are you here? You are illegal. There's a lot of hatred in that word. And unfortunately, another word that is becoming, it is practically a, a, an abuse, a term of abuse is Bangladeshi, okay? When, when it, it has, I have heard people, two perfectly, uh, what shall I say, mainstream looking people who live in Assam, when they're angry with each other, it says, toy Bangladeshi. It's really bad. Okay, it's like any other gali uh, there. So, um, these things are there and these evolve with time and I find that hatred words evolve much faster than goodwill words, okay? Um, so, uh, these, this, this is a symptom of the othering. And I'm not saying in any way that these problems are not there. Of course, there's a problem of illegal migration, illegal immigration, but that also because I think one, one uh, if my panelists, co-panelists will agree with me, I don't know, one of the things that is really ingrained is in, in, in us as who come from that part of the world is this question of shifting borders. Throughout my adult life, I have uh, coped with shifting borders, okay? Uh, growing up in one part, growing up in another part, going to another part, uh, calling one part of the region my home, then suddenly it is not my home, then suddenly this part is my home, but, but, you know, and but this, but that. So because you come back, come from somewhere, you may be from there, but culturally you feel a little alien there in the beginning. 
So these shifting borders and what you said about Silchar, uh, Kachar, I mean, that was, it was really strange what happened at that time, um, before we were born perhaps, but certainly. And that shifting sense of shifting borders is happening even today because in, within most of these states, several of these states, there are these conflicts going on which again ask, demand their own borders in different ways. And there have been negotiations. They, they, uh, perhaps there is a demand for a, for a very strong border, but another, a lighter border has been you know, negotiated and all that. So that is one thing. And then that othering takes another form. Within those borders, what was home becomes the other. So that has really disturbed me in many ways. And as a writer, I think it comes out also. Yeah, uh, as uh, moderator told us to bring in some of the political issues. One of the connected political issue, which uh, probably rest of the country is not so mindful about, is this uh, updating of National Register of Citizens as it is happening in case of Assam. It has left 40 lakhs people stateless in one stroke of the pen, supposed to be the highest number of enforced statelessness anywhere in the world in the name of solving illegal immigration problem. Uh, and what has gone wrong there is that everyone is made a citizen on the basis of certain documents, as if citizen depends on documentary evidences. Constitutionally speaking, Indian constitution doesn't ask for documentary evidences in order to prove one's citizenship. But in case of Assam, an exception has been made that one has to prove one's citizenship by furnishing certain kinds of documents. And strangely enough, in that document, one has to not only prove one's own citizenship, but also one has to give a, a connection to the ancestors, the ancestral connection, the parental linkage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this kind of uh, linkage is called legacy data. Now, legacy is important for any inheritance law. It is never important for citizenship, because citizenship is based on just solis. In most of the liberal democratic countries, it's never based on just sanguinis. So you derive your citizenship from the bloodline in case of Assam, which is not the case in the rest of India. So a citizen of India cannot be citizen of India in Assam unless his or her ancestors lived in Assam for a certain period within 71, 25th March. But the constitutional provisions for determination of citizenship are kept in abeyance. And a new set of rules have been created by the executive, which doesn't have a constitutional basis. Although a two-member judge, two-member bench of the Supreme Court is asking uh, enforcement of those rules. Now, it's a very strange situation. Constitution doesn't say certain things. While executing, you bring in those things. And those things come from the Supreme Court bench. So, so it's a very strange kind of a arbitrary legal procedure that has been conducted in Assam. Now, what has happened uh, in the suspicion that these NRC left out people may enter into Arunachal Pradesh, in Manipur, in Meghalaya, the vigilante group started catching anyone who was entering in Meghalaya, in Arunachal Pradesh, or in Manipur, and asking them their proof of citizenship on the road, on the street. Is there any place in India where on the street you have to furnish the proof of citizenship? There is no place. Even in the most disturbed days of Punjab, I can see a Punjabi veteran here, uh, nobody really asked a question about a Punjabi citizenship who are also equally partition victims. But in case of Assam, if someone speaks Bengali, he is suspected, he or she is suspected to be a non-Indian. And the strangest of the entire thing in the country is that Assam has six detention centers. In the detention center, 2,000 people are kept indefinitely without any trial. They have to spend their life in detention centers, being deprived of all the fundamental rights that are professed by the Indian constitution. It's something similar to Nazi concentration camp, although there is no torture, evidently, but people are incarcerated. They are deprived of their right to life as prescribed in Article 19 to Article 21. They are deprived of all legal redress and they are kept as animals there in the detention camp. So this is what has happened in the northeastern part of India in the name of othering. 
in the name of not understanding probably the pain of the other. Yeah. So I have been asking in some of my articles, what happens when the final National Register of Citizens is out? There are 40 lakh people outside who've fallen between the cracks. Even if uh, 10 lakhs are in, what happens to the 30 lakh others? There is no way forward because Bangladesh is not going to take them. You don't have a plan beyond that. So I think we are looking at a very dismal future because there will be violence and uh, you don't know what the spin-offs will be. And because of this whole exercise in Assam, the other northeastern states are also in the grip of fear. So now even those states that do not have the inner line permit, you know that if you go to Mizoram, Arunachal and Nagaland, you have to take an inner line permit with you, otherwise you're not allowed to enter those states. And the reason is because they're so fearful that the outsider might go and reside there permanently. Uh, states like Meghalaya, Manipur, Assam don't have this inner line permit. But now there are all these groups that are demanding and making it a political issue and because governments tend to succumb to these sort of pressures, very soon you might have you know, the, go the government itself saying, yes, we'll have an inner line permit at Meghalaya. And Meghalaya is not a dead end state. If you go to Mizoram, you, you reach Mizoram and you can't go beyond. But Meghalaya is a transit state. So how do you enforce an inner line permit in a transit state? That is a, a question that nobody wants to answer yet but they will have to answer it subsequently. Then you also have this whole thing about uh, the northeastern states sharing a boundary of only 4% with India through the chicken's neck near Siliguri. The rest, 96% is bordered by international countries, no? Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Bhutan, China, so, uh, and, and very interestingly, India has not paid much attention to this whole problem. They've thought that just by, you know, by not creating the infrastructure there, it will make it difficult for anyone who, come, who wants to attack the region there, who wants to attack India through that region, which happened in 1962, by the way, the Chinese attacked us and came up to Tejpur, for some reason, some political reason, they went back. And uh, since then, not much infrastructure has come up in the region. The roads are, oh, you must come to Nagaland to see that there are no roads, of course. There's only slush and mud. In 70 years, we haven't been able to construct roads even in the capital city of Nagaland. Then you go to Manipur, it's the same. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, I don't know, regressive situation where the center at Delhi thinks it can push in money and keep those political powers there happy and not care about how that money is used. So there's absolutely no monitoring. There's very high level of corruption. And there's Nagaland, which is demanding a sovereign country. The government is pushing in more money there. Nothing is happening. Everything is in a status quo as kind of mode. So if you try and resolve the problems of the northeastern states, you will end up nowhere. You'll be a dead duck. It's too incomprehensible, even for those of us living there. We are just moving from day to day, you know, and we are living our lives like very, in a very transient sort of way because we don't know what happens next. It's called a region of conflict. And rightly so, because you have so many uh, ethnic militant groups, each one fighting for a homeland, if not for sovereignty. How many homelands you can have in a single state is debatable. But then there's also this other thing, that the, the groups which have the loudest voices, they, ha they have their grievances addressed very readily. But there are groups. You know, like the, there is a group called the Tea Tribes of Assam, the Adivasis who've come, come in from Orissa, from Jharkhand during the British period. They suffer the worst kind of um, 
negligence from the government, discrimination, very high maternal mortality, very high infant mortality, but they do not have a voice. And nobody speaks about them. They're forgotten. They're actually a forgotten community, although they make up about 20% of the population of Assam. So if you look at the Bodos, I, I don't know how many of you, you here have heard of the Bodos as a community. They are demanding statehood now. They have very loud voices. They know how to get the attention of government of India, state government. But the Adivasis, who have been uprooted every now and again, whenever there's an ethnic conflict, they're uprooted. Many of them are still living in camps. Nobody really cares. So it's, it's kind of a dismal situation, but I think it's important for people from outside the region to please come and see and understand and write, because maybe we also need to get an outsider's perspective. We're kind of going down a, a terrible spiral, but this is the last step in that. Um, the third othering that I really want to talk about is something that absolutely nobody knows about. Now, we already kind of spoke about the amount of communities there. Almost every state has, Manipur has 31 recognized tribes, Arunachal has close to 20, I'm thinking, Assam has even more, Nagaland has 56, as said before. And these are recognized ethnicities with different languages who identify differently. The government of India and the British before them have given them one identity, so the, Na the Nagas in Nagaland are called Nagas. But do they all identify as Nagas? Not necessarily so. Everyone who's in the state of Manipur to an outsider is a Manipuri, but do they identify as Manipuri? Not necessarily so. And what usually happens, therefore, is in states that have this kind of a mixed ethnicity, often because of the amount of marginalization, communities turn against communities, and the Northeast has been a boiling pot of these kind of issues, be it the Naga Kuki, Mete issue in Manipur that never seems to solve, or the Nagas in the East and the Nagas from the West and how they fight between each other, or in Assam, for example, the Bodos versus Ahomia, the Kacharis versus Ahomia, the Bishnupriyas and how they're pushed out, and communities within a state to an outsider, people say, you oh, know, they're all Assamis, but they really aren't, and how they're fighting with each other is something that you also need to understand. So we're going to spend a very, very little short time to talk about these nuances within states and how they affect how we look at ourselves. So um, let me start with Manipur. Manipur um, has three major communities, again, defined largely by the British, not necessarily defined by the communities themselves. People are largely categorized into Naga tribes, Kuki tribes or Chin tribes, and the Mete majority, which is in the center. At one point of time, <clears throat> And there was a huge fight between the Nagas and the Kukis, and it led to 10 years of violence. The amount of people who were killed is, even till date, we don't have a number to it, but it's easily in the 20,000s, 30,000s. People were just going across the state and slashing and killing people if they belong to the other tribe. And the problem in Manipur especially is each of these communities look different. So when you can, a Mete can say a Naga from a Kuki, and a Kuki can differentiate a Mete from a Naga, and so therefore there was, nobody needed to ask anything, they would just go into a village and kill everyone. And somehow these identities got developed by the killing of the other. So Kuki nationalism grew because they were able to attack Nagas, Naga nationalism grew because they were able to attack Kukis. Somewhere in between, the Metes turned against the Nagas, and today we were talking about the inner line permits. One of the biggest reasons Manipur is asking for an inner line permit is because they want to keep the Nagas out of Nagaland, saying that we will talk about who is ethnically a Manipuri, who is ethnically Mete, how do we keep other people out of the state. And the funny thing is, if you look at the populations of the state, the Nagas and the Kukis are actually in majority, the Metes are in minority. But these kind of uh, number games will always be played. And th there is no solution to this problem, because if you solve the Naga Kuki problem, you'll have the Mete Kuki problem. You solve the Mete Kuki problem, you'll have a Mete Naga problem. You solve that problem, there'll be, again, the other two communities against each other. It's been going on for years, and I don't think it is ever going to see a solution. Saddeningly, a lot of uh, militant groups come out of these horrible movements, and um, a lot of them get their identity from them. And, and then they start being the voice, as Patricia beautifully said, the loudest voices are the ones that are often heard. And then you have a government of India trying to actually negotiate with these militant groups, which are technically not the groups we should be negotiating with. But that's just the case of Manipur. Okay. Um, yes, of course, what you said. Uh, 
othering within the states happens in my state because of all the uh, so many ethnicities are here but also assam if i may go back a little bit to the history uh, this this entire india's northeast a large part of it was once administratively called assam okay uh, and this was not a natural state at all it, this was put on us by the british who came up and then for uh, administrative purposes they created the capital in shillong and that became the capital of assam and after independence it was a huge unwieldy and totally i would think ungovernable state and uh, so uh, in the 70s and late 60s they there was a division into uh, different different uh, states so now we have uh, seven states sikkim was different anyway so uh, so the thing is you know this othering if you have lived uh, long enough it becomes very complicated okay uh, at one point assam is my state and at another point assam uh, this part of assam is not my state and now of course there's a lot of othering going on in er areas such as boroland as you mentioned where uh, as patricia patricia said that they have a loud louder voice than the for instance coach rajbongshis who are uh, lo who have been living there and you know they are people who have not they are not bound they are people who are spread across assam north bengal parts of what is not bangladesh so and they are the same culturally ethnically they are the same and yet uh, and you know some books have been written because um, uh, i know this writer orupa patangia who has been writing about the kind of conflict that has been going on in in boroland uh, the the area that is boroland and how these people you know they are they are coming in they are coming in they are persecuted in one region so they come to this region they are persecuted again in another region and then the mother is dead anyway so the daughter comes and they keep moving forward and yet nothing is home because it's always there so this othering is happening very much and i think this this uh, NRC has given a huge impetus to this othering already there are people who are saying see they feel vindicated that we have always said that there are so many bangladeshis okay anybody is a bangladeshi and so these 40 lakhs are bangladeshis which is not the case at all if you look at it in technical terms so othering anything that happens NRC is also a big tool for othering right now uh thanks to mitra for bringing in assam situation i also technically come from assam but the other valley of assam which is called barak valley of assam and it's not included in the mental scape of assam as part of assam but uh, apart from that i would like to speak about my own experiences uh, as i grew up in kohima and then we moved to silchar and then from silchar to itanagar then back to guwahati and then to silchar it's that's my trajectory of my formation period of my life now now through that i have experienced multiple forms of othering in arunachal pradesh where i grew up as a child i have seen this internecine conflict and a kind of suspicion between nishis on the one hand apatanis on the other hand galos on the other hand adis on the other hand adis apatanis galos and nishis they kept on internecine quarrel and conflict now theoretically we say this is a conflict over resources and power but it goes down to settling who is more authentic than the other there is a question of authenticity attached to one's claim of belonging to a community or to a place now that kind of a claim of authenticity is most often a kind of a presumptive justification for one's claim for resources and power but this presumptive justification is not supported by the legal framework of rationality because in the legal framework of rationality everyone is supposed to be equal and the question of equality creates the greatest question of inequality inequal sharing inequal access to resources and it ends up by creating inequities of all kinds so apatanis would perceive that it is nishis who are more powerful they would like to align themselves with nishis adis would say that this alignment between apatani and nishis have to be broken down so there will be a fall of the government and mass these elected mlas 
will move away from one party to another party. And the overnight, the whole government will change. And this is what has been happening in Orunachal Pradesh. My father is still a pensioner from Orunachal Pradesh. He is 93. And I keep close connection with Orunachal Pradesh, although I do not belong to Orunachal Pradesh. Now, if I say I belong to Barak Valley, then my identity also becomes quite problematic. If I say I belong to Assam, then people will ask me, aren't you an Assamese? Uh, now, if I say I'm a Bengali-speaking Assamese in the sense that I live in Assam, the same fate is shared by Nagas in Manipur. If a Naga person from Manipur says he's a Naga from Manipur and a Manipuri Naga, and that becomes a kind of a portmanteau, a kind of a port portradactyl's egg, you know, as it is described by Satyajit Rai in one of his science fiction. So, so we become fictional entities in terms of our own authentic self-description, which is actually borrowed from the other. Large part of it comes from the other as a response to the other in the sense of creating a differentia with the other. And this is what guides our rationality, our consciousness, to make ourselves different from the others. And, and this sense of difference actually creates a large part of perplexity by which our own authenticity also vanishes into what Ranjit beautifully quoted as liquid modernity. The liquid modernity in the context of Northeast India is this vanishing traces of self-identity to which we can't ascribe any authenticity anymore. I would like to speak a little about my state of Meghalaya because I come from a matrilineal society. So in a matrilineal society, the lineage is from the mother's clan line. And uh, recently, there was a bill that was passed over there in my state saying that a Khasi woman who marries a non-Khasi, non-tribal, will lose her Khasi status and her scheduled tribe status, and so will her children. So there's a huge controversy going raging on now about this as uh, women are, you know, a section of women are standing up against the bill while the other, um, you know, a, another large ignorant section is, uh, you know, uh, sort of supporting the bill because there is this Islamophobia that has come in. Almost as if, uh, you know, the, the, in, in Nagaland, Anyone who looks, uh, who doesn't have a Naga face is called an IBI. IBI is illegal Bangladeshi immigrant. In our state, he is called a Bangladeshi. And women are accused of marrying Bangladeshis and that those men are taking advantage of the women, buying off land, buying property, doing business in the woman's name. So that has to stop. And that fear psychosis has spread like wildfire. So now there's a raging fire there. And uh, it's always, you know, women are always blamed. Although if you, you have all the laws in place, in the Northeast, at least in my state of Meghalaya, no non-tribal person can buy land. There is the Land Transfer Act. There is another act called Trading by Non-Tribal Act, which means that a non-tribal has to have a license in order to be able to trade over there. So we have these laws in place, and yet, you know, we are all the time living in some kind of phobia. And uh, people are sort of manipulated to vote on the basis of this fear. And I don't know how many of you here are aware that our borders in that part of the country were drawn by somebody called Sir Radcliffe. Recently, I read this, this essay written by, I can't remember the name, who said that the way Radcliffe drew the border was he, he gave away Lahore to Pakistan because he said that uh, India already has many big towns like Calcutta and others. So just imagine that our present and our future is determined by some white man who didn't know what he was doing, who he was separating from whom. If you come to Meghalaya, you will find the boundary or the border cutting right through people's homes. So the kitchens are in present Bangladesh, at that time East Pakistan, their sitting rooms are this side. Now how do you negotiate this, this new identity? 
there was no Bangladesh many years ago. Bangladesh happened in 1971. And yet, even those who came before that are today called Bangladeshis. So, you know, we, <laughs> I really find it so difficult to speak about the region because every state poses a very, very, uh, yeah, a, a very, very unique problem. For instance, um, most of these states did not sign the instrument of accession to the Indian nation. The Khasi chieftains signed this instrument of accession, but they also had a standstill agreement where they said that we will only hand over currency, foreign affairs, and blah, blah to India, and we will look after the rest ourselves. But that didn't happen. And now, let me come to the mining bit. You know, again, Meghalaya is a state that is very rich in coal, limestone. We also have uranium. Now, coal was mined so recklessly, it, we have what is known as the rat hole mining, where you really need to go down and then down below, under those mines, the elderly people cannot move there. They cannot negotiate themselves. So young people below 14 years actually go in to bring out the coal. So that was uh, actually, it came, it, it surfaced because of some journalists or some, some researchers. And the naturally the government of India came down very heavily. Then there were, there were 15 deaths in a coal mine and those bodies were never found. That was when the National Green Tribunal banned coal mining. But we have limestone and limestone is termed as a minor mineral. And every day you have 300 trucks of limestone going into Bangladesh. And you see whole mountains coming down. You get, you, you're so appalled but nobody bothers, nobody cares, and sometimes you feel that what's happened in Kerala will very soon happen to us. That is the kind of state we're living in. The irony of the Northeast is, is very clearly mentioned here. On one side, you have states that are minerally rich like Manipur, where there is no mining happening, no nothing happening whatsoever because they're so scared about a state being in that corner. And then where it does happen, like in the case of Meghalaya, it goes overboard and absolute madness. Like for example also, I don't know how many of you all know that a lot of the tablets that you have are often made in Meghalaya. The pharmacy industry is one of the biggest in India. And one of the reasons why most pharmacy, uh, pharmaceuticals are based in Meghalaya is because the laws are much more easier to deal with. So for example, free access to water, nobody is really looking at what kind of water you're using, how much water you're using and also free cheap labor. So a lot of the pharma uh, pharmaceutical industries have moved from south of India, including your CIPLA, your Pfizer, tax absolutely huge tax holidays. So in some ways we have states going absolutely overboard with the way they are dealing with industry and then you have states that are getting absolutely no industry. So it's a very strange uh, situation where some states are progressive in that way but not necessarily and some states aren't. Um, I think we've done three rounds of giving you an idea of what the Northeast is. And now we'll move into something more specific to each of our panelists, which is how has the Northeast that they have lived in affected their writing? And how has their writing reflected this Northeastern experience that they've had? Uh, before that, I think um, let's play another round of random places in the Northeast and let's see if this gets any better. I'm going to use places that they've spoken of. So um, let's see if you'll know now. <laughs> okay, where is Barak Valley? <laughs> Assam, okay, thank you. Um, Kohima is the capital of? I am wow. very impressed, <laughs> okay. We've not spoken a lot about Tripura and uh, Mizoram and what we'll do, Dimapur. yeah, okay. Dimapur is in which state? No, Nagaland. <laughs> Okay, we've not talked a lot about Tripura and Mizoram, but what we'll do is after this, all of us are going to be available and we do have inputs on the states of Tripura and uh, um, Mizoram also, but none of us have those experiences to talk about in terms of writing. But if you do have any of those questions, we have half an hour of a question session. Please feel free to ask us those questions. Now for the next half an hour, I'm going to ask my panelists to talk about this. How has being a Northeastern, living in whichever part of the Northeast you are, affected your writing? And how successful have you been in reflecting the cultures that you've brought up in, the politics that you've been brought up in, in your writing? 
Um, yes, uh, as a fiction writer mostly, and also uh, non-fiction to an extent, I think as far as I am concerned for me, writing has been um, the act of bearing witness, okay? And I have lived through some, uh, my generation has lived through some really tumultuous times in Assam, in, in that particular region as well. Uh, so yes, even, even uh, you know, politically, the politics of the place has always been a very much a part of my writing, though as fiction, I do not write specifically of politics, but the, the effects of politics on my characters, because as a fiction writer, it is character, it is plays, it is uh, plot and so on. But through the interaction of um, the political scenario, especially in my novel, The Collector's Wife, uh, which is where the background, the, it begins as a background of the Assam agitation, the students' agitation and so on. And then the, uh, the character, uh, you know, in my mind, I wanted it like that, uh, is that, that uh, the agitation looms so large that the characters are helpless, though agency is kind of taken away from them. Yeah, so that is actually, I felt at that time, when I was living through that and the alpha problem and so on, and what really, and I have kept, that keeps recurring in my works, including my short stories, is that, you know, during the height of that alpha problem, to mention the word alpha, I could, none of us could speak like this about alpha. And then uh, there would be disappearances. I live in the safest, supposedly, part of um, Assam, Zunarangi Road, the heart of Guwahati. There were people around me, my friends, their husbands, their children. A young boy was kidnapped. And uh, I'll never forget that, you know, when, when my children came. And they came running to me and they said, you know, so-and-so has been taken away. And that terror in the face and that found yeah, in one of my children's books, actually. I had found a place there. Uh, so we are always bearing witness, especially with uh, fiction. And even when I write of music, my monsoon of music is about music, and I made a conscious decision. You know, politics kept threatening to come in because it has come into the musical world also. Mu uh, it has, but I wanted to keep it Shastriya Sangeet without politics. So that was also a conscious decision. Not to write of politics is also political, I would think, yeah. And then uh, in my, uh, you know, whether people are writing in my state in English or in so many languages, Bangla, Boro, or uh, Assamese, of course, that, that, that era, I would say, in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was absolutely political. You couldn't get away with it. So I think it's a sign of the times that in all these languages, there are other things that are being talked about. There are other things that are being written about. And there is more of an integration with the world outside Assam and, and so on. So I think somehow we are coming out of the, but there are of course different kinds of political pushes and pulls happenings which are uh, being reflected in the stories as well. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting thing to think about how the situations of Northeast find a place in one's writings. Uh, primarily my writings are in philosophy and in social sciences. In philosophy, I have sort of explored into various kinds of ethno-philosophies that are available in the communities of Northeast. For example, Naga concept of kindness, or Naga concept of polite, politeness, and the Mizo concept of being a hero, or Kasi concept of being a virtuous, are they comparable? In what ways these concepts relate to the mainstream Indian concepts? Because we have something called Indian philosophy, which is a combination of at least nine different schools of thinking, whether that kind of thinking is present among the communities of India's Northeast or not, was a major question for me. So I looked at their conceptual categories, just as African philosophers, many of them have looked into conceptual categories of African communities. Similarly, I tried to look at conceptual categories of Apatanis, Khasis, Mizos, some of the Naga tribes, uh, and some other communities as well. And what I find that each of the conceptual category has its own world for itself. 
These worlds are self-enclosed. Most of the time, they don't even crisscross in terms of the language that they speak. For example, Mizo group of tribe, they have a, a, an imaginary sacred landscape called the Land of the Dead, which is located on the, uh, on the northernmost part of Mizoram, bordering Myanmar in a certain lake called Lake Riedel, which falls within the geographical territory of, uh, of Myanmar. Now, Mizos go there for pilgrimage by crossing the border. Informally, they cross the border. They perform the rites and rituals by invoking their ancestors, and they carry the memory of invoking ancestors to their daily lives. There seems to be a kind of a dialogue that happens on every important occasion of a tribal person and his or her ancestors. The grandparents, the great-grandparents are always present in their midst. And this kind of an imagination of a sacred landscape in the home state, in the domestic sphere, gives rise to a number of rituals. And we can see this in the context of Ornachal Pradesh. There are Lapang festivals. There are Morong festivals. There are a number of other festivals that are basically invocation of the memory of the ancestor, but spoken in terms of certain chants, certain ritual forms of music, and a certain kind of performance, which in English term may be called as voodoo or black magic as well. But these forms of life still are inhabited and lived among many communities with a rich conceptual rigor and a repertoire, which is not represented in the mainstream of Indian writing. I write about this, and much of my writings encompass this. The other thing is about development. To what extent the developmental paradigms or developmentalism as practiced by the Indian state or by the global capital affect the Northeastern communities? One of the major issues is dam building. In a small state like Arunachal Pradesh, 178 dams to generate power is created. And it is all under construction in various phases. And it is causing a huge ecological and climactic disaster to the extent that the people downstream, the lower riparian people, are completely ripped apart because of the dams at the upstream. Same as the story in the case of Brahmaputra Valley, Barak Valley, in case of Mizoram, even in case of Meghalaya, certain dams are cracking. And you can see everywhere dams have been built up. The other thing that has happened is random mining, example of which has come from Kong Pat. Random mining is also happening in Assam or natural border. It's happening in Barak Valley, it's happening in Manipur, and in many other such places in Nagaland. In Nagaland, it's very interesting that after some years of mining, mining oil and crude oil, the corporations of oil industry, they left these places wide open. And in various places, oil is still spilling out. The crude oil is still spilling out in, in Nagaland, especially in Okha district, where I uh, visited during my childhood. I can see my, uh, from my childhood friends, I can hear that oil spills are still increasing. And a huge landscape is getting spoiled. Government of India or ecological uh, department are not taking any care of it. So developmentalism is leading to several kinds of disasters, natural, human, and other kinds of non-human disasters as well. We have lost almost 6,000 fish, fish species in both Brahmaputra and Barak, two major river systems of Northeast India. We have lost 6,000 insects which are all very important from the biodiversity point of view in the Tibet or natural border. We have also lost the tracks through which animals have migrated from Himalayas down to Northeast India, up to Kajiranga and many other places. Those tracks have been lost and because of that, there is a huge animal-human conflict happening everywhere across Northeast India. My writing reflects on some of this. I won't elaborate much, I'll leave this uh, to Paul. Well, if you come to the hill states where the tribes live, that's largely Mizoram, Nagaland, Meghalaya, you'll find a lot of uh, talk about culture. You know, but we've also lost a lot of the essence of that culture to Christianity. So that's the dichotomy that we, we don't seem to have negotiated very well. 
there is a section of Khasis or Garos, very, very small section of Garos, who still follow their indigenous faith. But the large majority now are Christians. And then, you know, you bring in that whole idea of patriarchy from Christianity. Then you interpose that with the matrilineal, and you, you get a concoction that's very devilish at the best of times. Then uh, the Northeast is not exactly a liberal space for any writer. Uh, in the month of May, I wrote an article for scroll.in explaining why there was this uh, skirmish between the so-called Mazhabi Sikhs in, in my area and the Khasi people. And I tried to go back to history and to say that there's always been this tension between tribe, non-tribe. And then uh, I put that up, you know, we are also in the age of social media. So I put that up on my Facebook page. There were many people who commented. Some of them said, this is very revealing. We didn't know of this. But, and then there was one researcher from the university who also put in his comment. But he was cornered so badly by people from the university itself. So you can imagine that even in the academic space, there's no liberal space for anyone to really express their views. But despite all the negatives, I must tell you that music is something that is inherent to the region. I'm sure you've heard of the Shalong Chamber Choir, haven't you? They've performed here, they've performed everywhere, Pune, Bangalore, um, Chennai, wherever, Bombay, and internationally. So you have this repertoire of very good musicians and good music, but whether we're able to capitalize on music as our USP is, is debatable because we are all the time so inward looking, so you know, regressive in our outlooks towards life that even music now is, is kind of a very aggressive sort of music. Today, for instance, there will be um, a celebration of the, of the, of the throwing, throwing out of Section 377 in my uh, capital city of Shillong. But I can imagine the kind of music that will come there. It'll be that hard metal, you know, because gentleness has just gone out of the window. I don't know where it's disappearing, and I don't know whether this is really good for our young people. This is the culture that our young people are growing up in. Because the, the, the original cultural values of the tribes were really something that, you know, that spoke of love and acceptance and brotherhood and fraternity, all that is gone. And then you speak about Christianity. Christianity, I thought, was a religion of love, but I don't know where that love has also gone. And then, you know, nobody from the Northeast wants anyone from outside to write about the region, because they think they're going to misrepresent. So, so it's a double whammy. <laughs> Because you were talking of the music and the culture and so on, to um, so about my state, there are uh, there is one specially very positive thing. Uh, this was the almost extinction of a dance form called Khotria. It was almost extinct, and what was being performed was a, actually a travesty. You know, it was like they were all dressed in sequins and satin and all. But today, and if you look at it, is a, a, it is from it was you know uh, part of the Vaishnav movement, Hongkor Dev, Srimanta Hongkor Dev, uh, whom we consider a saint. Uh, he started it. So, but today it has reached the classical dance status, and it is uh, to bring some positivity into it. It is a dance of love. It is a dance of pure love and pure devotion. And uh, among all the, I don't know, I'm not comparing, but I think, and because mostly the practitioners wear white and all that, and it is just pure devotion. So that is one excellent thing that has happened in the field of culture, since we were talking about music. Um, and the other thing is Bihu, okay? Bihu is uh, as recognizable as Bhangra these days, which was not, not the case some time ago. 
Um, so I think from my state, I can say that there have been these two, in spite of, or maybe because of, the terrible troubles that we went through, I think that made us look a little bit more consciously at ourselves, that what do we have? What is our, you know, our roots, what is it? And that made us look a little consciously, and then that, that evolved or that we went back and we did some research and we tried to do the essence, the purity of these forms, and that has come. So I think that's a good thing that's happening in my state. I think just to add to that also, um, I'm, I'm really happy that we're talking about the positives of this othering. Um, in my native state of Manipur also, for example, for a very, very long time, people talked about Manipuri dance and everyone, I'm sure you all know that dance, you know, you're in a barrel and very, very delicate and all of that. Uh, but in the state of Manipur, if you go back right now, that dance is slowly being forgotten because that was actually part of the Vaishnava tradition. Yeah. And a lot of dances that had been lost are now coming back. So today, for example, a lot of classical practitioners in, in Imphal, for example, would keep saying, don't call our dance Ras Leela. Our dance is called Jagoe. And Ras Leela is just a form of Jagoe. Yeah, and so a lot of other forms of dance that were prevalent in Manipur are now coming back. And so when, when these groups go across the world and across India and present dance, you'd hardly ever see them perform the Ras Leela. They'll perform the Mai Bija Goe, they'll perform all of these other things. So much so, I think recently, A. R. Rahman also came to Manipur and recorded a song with a traditional singer. So I think the othering and this creation of the fa this, this identity that we are different, very, very different from you, but we also identify with you, is, is creating positive uh, sit uh, situations in some fields. And uh, as I do agree with both of you all that music might be the, the way forward for the Northeast. Also, traditionally, I think most tribes, our storytelling form is music. Our, our folk tales are music, our histories are in music. So it's, it's definitely very, very important to us. Um, the last round of um, questions that I'm going to ask them is basically about new styles of literature in the Northeast. A lot of Northeastern writers um, often wrote only in the language that they, that they grew up in, which is if you were from Manipur, you wrote in Meite or one of the Naga tribal languages or whatever. But today, to reach out to a larger audience, a lot of authors are choosing to write in English instead of waiting for it to be translated by someone else. And this is something that is changing the way people look at the Northeast, because you're having Northeasterners write about their own experiences in a language that is globally understandable. Um, there are a lot of Mizo authors that I know who are doing this, some of them based out of Bangalore, a lot in Delhi. But I think my panelists here would be able to give you a lot more uh, light on that particular topic. Um, yes, so uh, the storytelling traditions uh, in this region um, they are diverse, absolutely diverse. In Manipur, it has been, the written word has been there for a, for a very, in the region, it has been there for the longest time. Uh, Assam, the written word has been there since the sixth century, where the Buddhist monks were uh, writing about it, and then uh, it, it developed into various uh, forms. Um, and uh, noteworthy also are the Buronjis, or the historical documents of the Ahoms, uh, who wrote who wrote the chronicles and so on and then of course you come to the 19th 20th century where the poets and so on the dramatists and all. it's a very rich culture and uh, in all of this they were written in the languages of the land and uh, in all of this English took a very 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 back backmost seat very little though translations were there not all, not all the translations were good, but it was recognized that these were, these were worthy of translation and they were translated. Uh, but now, I think for the last 15 years or so, not even that, that long, 15, 20 years, and uh, original writings in English have now suddenly burst upon the scene uh, in, across the whole region. Because in certain regions, there was this very rich oral tradition but, uh, and there were scripts, there were scripts that were lost, for instance, in the boroughs, and there were scripts that were changed, there were scripts that came, that there were scripts that went, but the oral tradition remained very strong. That is a language of storytelling in itself. And in the meantime, as Patricia said, there was uh, Christianity, there was missionary education, there was English medium education. So, uh, a lot of writing is now coming out in English. 
Okay, and this is reaching out uh, to a much wider audience. English has that power. And the good thing is that a lot of writings, these writings are also coming back into translation. My works have been translated back into SMEs as well. So these, uh, this translation back and forth is happening. Uh, and, tra and translations from these languages into English are also happening. And we have these wonderful writers such as uh, Janice Pariyat from uh, Meghalaya, Mamang Dai from Arunachal, you name it, there are so many. Um, and by doing this, I think culture is a large word, literature is a large word, uh, but the written word has a power, okay? And when the written word reaches out in a language that is intelligible, that can be read by so much of the world's population, and then the, the publishing houses are also showing, show, taking an interest, they're showing, showing interest in the poet, poetry, the poetry of Meghalaya, they're known as the Shillong poets, and they are taught all over the world. Uh, so these things are telling us, you know, that othering, it's building bridges in a way, in the way music and literature and so many aspects of our culture, they, they build bridges, yes? So through this, I think, and the fact that so much is coming out in English and you don't have to go through a, often a painful translation or even if it is a good translation, much is lost. But when it is written originally and the writer negotiates her culture, and a language that is not hers. It is not, it is not her mother tongue. It may be her first language, but it, may, it is not her mother tongue. So that creates a kind of an elasticity, a kind of a, as if, you know, the writer herself is learning as she goes. The writer, I'm saying she, the writer herself is uh, reaching out to an audience and in the process, she is telling them, look, I am telling you something that has never been said in this language before. So that is creating something, and I think that's a wonderful thing. It is a way of creating bridges. I read about Meghalaya, I read about Manipur in English, and I understand so much, even within the region. So I can understand that what it must be doing to people around the world. Uh, I'll just add to this, because Northeast is a very vast ethnographic repository, and there is so much of ethnographic uh, material available at the ground level, also at the experiential or the level of the writing, that uh, this is vast, illimitable, inexhaustible as it stands today. Now, some of these writings have come from inside the community. There are uh, ethnographers from within the community, and these uh, auto-ethnographers or ethnographers of the community writing about themselves have produced a tremendous literature. And much of this literature is in English, although some of it is in local and the native languages as well. Now, one of these um, very interesting ethnographic kind of uh, novel, which I have come across, which I think anyone will know, uh, Thongse Yangse Dorji, yes. he is writing, writing about the practice of the Monpa tribe, how they dispose of their dead. They dispose of their dead by cutting the corpse into 100 pieces and throwing it into the Kalachini River from where the dead is supposed to regenerate themselves. And this practice is still there in the Tawang region of Orunachal Pradesh. And Dorji describes the protagonists, uh, protagonists how they leave and how they will all fall dead and how through a third person narrator who also is supposed to be someone who disposes the dead body. How through his eyes, the entire landscape and the human relations are described. Similarly, I have come across, because I grew up in Orunachal Pradesh, I've come across a fascinating Bengali novel published on a small tribe called Bokar tribe. The novel was published in 1956. It's written in Bengali by a noted ethnographer who wrote this famous trilogy on Orunachal Pradesh, the enticing Orunachal Pradesh trilogy, written by Mr. Tarun Bhattacharji. He wrote this novel in 1956. That describes how Orunachal tribes used to go up to Tibet, used to do trading with Tibetan communities, 
and how they used to be intermarriage, and how through this kind of a process of cultural interaction and trade relations, communities have shaped a certain kind of worldview that has come in their, uh, in that particular novel. Similarly, uh, okay, there is... And which will take care of the hepatitis C and B, not only hepatitis C and B, A to G and all the hepatitis markers will be taken care of by this thing. So I since the planet of HIV, as Rahul has stated in his thing, that he didn't get any HIV in the net. So they thought that uh, doing an explanation net is useless because our mandate is not... Oh it is we are not used to take care, but with the coming of the no, National no, no. Hepatitis Control Organization, I think this is the ethnographic voice of this place. The net may become a mandatory test in the coming years. Okay, so that is what we are anticipating. Uh, so just a little more, one, uh, one little more that I wanted to add. Uh, there are these musical forms in Northeast India about which there is some writing. And one of the major writing came from one gentleman called Tarun Goswami, whose daughter is my friend, she's Namrata Goswami, and she's in America. So Tarun Goswami, for the first time, had written about the extinct musical forms in Kirby Anglong. And he showed that there are certain beats and rhythms which defy the logic of you know, octave or octet or even the Saptasaro kind of tradition that India has, it has a very different uh, uh, repertoire of swaras and rhythms, which cannot be fitted into anything Indian or Western. But these forms of music are getting extinct. Mr. Guswami published that book in 1993. It's not much read, but that's a major you know, ethnographic compilation on music which constitutes a part of literature of the Northeast. Uh, and there are many such instances where we see that the musical instruments which uh, Nagas were playing in 19th century or the early part of 20th century, these musical instruments are still being played in certain villages of Nagaland. And the whole tune is so similar to some of the African or Native American tunes. Some people have located that. But not much work has, has, has gone into it. So there's a vast ethnographic resource available for literature to really address that and to cover it, which will require a lot of task on the Northeast, for which anyone who is interested in Northeast probably is most welcome, be it an insider or an outsider or, or whosoever it be. Maybe from a Meritan is also welcome if, if one looks into these resources. So that's it. Uh, I come from a state that has a whole range of folk tales, but all of them are very sad. But maybe it's like Keith said, no? the sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts. So uh, also, we are an oral tradition tribe. Our script was given to us by a Christian missionary in 1841. So you know, our, our written tradition is actually quite young. Most of our history has been written by the British, and we keep, you know, we keep learning about ourselves from those journals. So we don't really know whether we know ourselves. We only know that we, uh, like every other tribe, we have a divine origin. We originated straight from heaven. We were 16 tribes, and then uh, we commuted through a tree through a golden ladder, which is a tree. And one fine day, that tree was cut off. So 16 tribes remained on top, the, uh, up, and nine tribes, no, 16, no. So seven remained here, and nine remained up there. And the, the connection was lost forever. That is one of our folk tales. Um, I think that uh, you know, I, I write in English, but I'm very apologetic about it because I think I'm not reaching my own people enough. And there is a, an anxiety there. Even now when we have these, you know, these, these bouts of uh, anger and bouts of conflict, people say, why do you write for an outside audience? What about your, your own audience? So one really feels that one has to now start writing in uh, the indigenous language because uh, 
there's a there's a time when you need to connect with your own before you connect with the outside world so that's all i have to say and i i must thank the organizers here for giving us two solid hours we've never ever been given so much time to speak about ourselves and <laughs> i hope we are not being very narcissistic <laughs> Okay, so we've come to the end of uh, our panel discussion. We have some time for questions, but I think um, three, four things that I, I need to talk about before we get into that questions. Uh, they, these are themes that I think that I've seen across what we've talked about. The fact that um, while othering in the Northeast, othering in all these three different forms has caused a lot of problems, it has also led to um, a self-discovery of the cultures of the Northeast. And that's something that we have to be very uh, aware of. Like a lot of Northeastern people for a very long time didn't write about themselves, as Patricia beautifully pointed out, that our stories are being relearned from what the British rewrote of us. Um, in the case of Manipur, it's slightly different because as the written form was there for a very, very long time, there's a lot more to go back to and to relearn from. But um, while I do agree that it's important for us to um, write in the languages that we originally belong to, to reach out to, an, to our own community, in places like Manipur, which has a fractured identity and a lot of people do not even use the language anymore, sometimes surprisingly, English can be the language that can bring them together, especially in a state like Manipur, where each of these 31 languages have different ideas and they all believe they are better than the other one. It's impossible for me to write in any one language and then claim that, you know, I'm trying to reach out to you. And it, it's really sad because like in the state of Manipur, uh, Meite, which is called Manipuri as problematically, is considered the official state language. And constantly you have very old poets writing um, their versions of the unity of Manipur songs in Meite. And it makes no sense because most of the tribals don't even know what you're saying. So you have these songs broadcast on radio about how Hing Minisi Akhoi, which is let us all live together. And the tribals are just like, I don't know what, what are you saying? What are you talking about? I don't understand your language. But you turn on the radio and ev all broadcasting is in Meite and they don't even get it. So then in a state like Manipur, when you switch to English, suddenly people feel more inclusive because they're like, okay, fine. You actually understand that we don't get your language and you're using a language that we all can understand. So it's really surprising. What doesn't work in Meghalaya works in Manipur. What works in Manipur doesn't work in Nagaland. And each of these states has these, these wonderful um, nuances to themselves. So let's keep that in mind when we talk about the Northeast, that it's never going to be one homogeneous area. It's never going to be that. Each state is always going to have its own preferences, the way it looks at itself. And... Um, Coming from a state, I mean, from an area of shifting borders, I, I don't think any of us on this panel can say with any sort of authority that what you see as the Seven Sisters are going to be the Seven Sisters forever, yeah? Yeah, because these borders are constantly going to change. Uh, people are constantly going to want their own homelands. And today we might have seven states, tomorrow we might have 23 in the Northeast, you never know. Or it all could come together and we just decide to banish all. You, you don't know where this place is going to go because with more education and with more awareness of the self, different communities in the Northeast are waking up to who they are. And it's only been 60 years since they've had that access to education and the access to self-expression. So we have no clue where it's going. I mean, as a Northeastern myself, I have no clue. I don't know tomorrow if the state of Manipur is going to be the state of Manipur. The northern districts might very well become a part of Nagaland. And it would be good for the Nagas in Manipur for them to be a part of the Nagaland because the Mete majority in Manipur has not treated them well for more than 60 years. So these, these borders are constantly shifting. These allegiances are constantly shifting. And that's something that defines the Northeast, I think, in a, a very essential way. Yeah. Okay, with that, we'll stop talking and we open it up for questions. It doesn't have to be questions related to what we've spoken about. It can be any questions related to the Northeast. We have a distinguished panel here who can answer any of your questions. So please feel free to ask anything. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a specific question for Patricia, but anybody in the panel can answer this. You repeatedly talk about the possible, I mean, the happening religious conversion in the Northeast. Uh, what is the reason and what may be the solution? Uh, is it only a political or something extra is also there in, behind it? Well, it's part of the colonial project. It started as a colonial project and uh, people kind of, uh, not, not just in my state, but in all the other tribal states where you had head hunting, you know, as a practice. Uh, when the missionaries came, they, they said that that's a pagan practice. You better give it up. And uh, 
in, in other states, we had a lot of this black magic, this, that, and the works, and the rituals for, you know, for, for births and deaths were so expensive. But when Christianity came in, it made it quite simple, no, no expenses. So people adapted or, or converted for different reasons. Sometimes it's for reasons of, um, of bread and butter. The missionaries would give, you know, whatever was needed. Sometimes they gave works. Uh, so it's a multiple, you know, there are multiple reasons why people convert to, to Christianity. What has happened very subtly is that uh, the missionaries also ask the tribes to give up their cultural practices. So if you, in Nagaland, for instance, there's a big bonfire made and all those traditional jewelry that you're wearing were put in that bonfire because that was considered a pagan practice. In our, in our area also, uh, those who became Christians were not allowed to participate in the cultural dances anymore. But uh, if we are speaking English here today, it's because the missionaries built schools. It's because they built, uh, you know, health infrastructure. In, in most of the, in the back of beyond, you go anywhere, you'll find a missionary hospital or a dispensary where even the government doesn't reach. So many times we, we tell the government of India, why is it that, uh, you know, the, the Ramakrishna mission or some Hindu mission didn't come to educate us. And why are you now then, uh, why do you have a grouse against Christianity today or against Christians? So I hope I've answered your question. Uh, with the case of Christianity in the Northeast, it's, it's in different states, it's, it's a different ball game altogether. Like for example, in Manipur, because you have ethnic Vaishnavites, you have an ethnic uh, indigenous religion called Sanamahi, which is practiced largely in the valley. And then you have the tribals who are largely uh, Christian, right? Um, Christianity did a lot what none of these religions did to them. Like for example, Sanamahi was royally practiced by the kingdom of Manipur for a long time. And then you had a Vaishnavite um, saint from Bengal who came somewhere in the 17th century called Shantidas Gosai. And uh, basically, I think, I think the king was suffering with something as silly as piles. And this person came and helped him out of that particular situation and said, you have been blessed now. And then the king came, became a devout Vaishnavite. And then he converted his royal family into Vaishnavism and then made it the official state religion. But then even then, a king based out of Imphal was not able to convert everyone in the valley into Vaishnavism. So in the, margin, the, the peripheries of the valley, people continued to practice Sanamahi, right? Now, in a state like Manipur, we've always had this conversation that why change to Christianity? You could have always worshipped the local religion. But the truth of the matter is, under Sanamahi, everyone was considered equal. But the moment Vaishnavism came, sadly, Shantidas Gosai also brought in the caste system with him. And there was a need to create a Kshatriya, um, a Brahmin, a this or that, and the Shudras became the tribals. So much so today, in traditional Vaishnavite Mete society, they treat tribals as shudras, even till today, for no reason whatsoever, because they don't fall under the Varna system, but they became the shudras because nobody else could be the shudra, right? So then they became the shudras. So then when a community is forced to be the shudra in a system that they don't belong to, when they get respect from a religion like Christianity and they say, no, you are equal in the eyes of God, obviously they'll convert to Christianity, right? Forget Manipur, take Nagaland and Mizoram, 99% Christian, Christian states, right? Prior to that, people just thought they were headhunters, warriors, gatherers, food gatherers, blah, blah, blah. Their identity of being Naga itself was created by the Christians. Before the Christianity came to Nagaland, there were 56 different tribes who did not believe they were the same. But then they were put together under one bracket. Huh? They, killed they killed each other. They had hunted each other. And then suddenly this religion came and said, no, 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 you have linguistic relations. Your culture might be different, but you speak languages that are similar, and therefore you are the same. And the idea of Nagaland today was created by these missionaries, which is why they are such a strong Christian state, right? Where else in the world will you have a militant organization claiming to be Christian? Then after that, they become the government of, the country, of that state, and then now they want to call themselves a Christian state. They've actually asked the Republic of India to identify themselves as a Christian state. Because for them, Christianity is no more religion, it's politics, it's identity, right? Mizoram, same thing, majority Christian. 
their whole identity of culture comes from this tradition at least nagaland is going back they're saying we'll we'll rediscover our past we'll go back to our old culture we'll have our old festivals mizoram has doesn't want to do anything with its old culture it rather would identify as being christian today the government of mizoram is controlled by leaders of the church in mizoram the church is more powerful than the government in mizoram so in each of these places it's not a question of conversion it's not a question of that it's just that at that point of time the missionaries got there at a point of time and gave them a sense of identity gave them education gave them access to medical uh, you know um, medicine and all of those kind of things in states like assam and manipur however you can have this conversation as why you why is that conversion happening because there was something there prior to that but in states like nagaland and mizoram it's a different ball game altogether um oh, oh, sorry as far as uh, ethnic composition of any indian state is concerned no state is homogeneous so heterogeneity is everywhere but the instinct of othering in other states is much less as far as the northeast states is concerned the othering instinct is very high intense what is the reason i think before we take your answer you wanted to add to the previous one no i just wanted to say about this missionary thing in assam in the valleys the brahmaputra valley or the barak valley it was not that successful but uh, the the christian missionaries the baptist mission which was established in uh, sibsagar they set up the first printing press and they also uh did the first dictionary assamese so these are things that we are grateful for even though they were not that successful in converting um uh, but in places like boroland which again has a higher tribal power, there the christianity is very strong uh, so i'm not sure what this says um so this othering can i just say before ever anybody else says since i have the mic um i would say i would say for my um, analysis is that this othering is also happening because of extremely poor development because there is no cake to have okay when there is enough cake then you're busy eating it you're not othering you're saying don't don't do this don't do that no but if you come you will see suddenly that we are uh, uh, so much resources so many things but and governance has always been very poor very poor we are cursed with poor governance always and uh, so i think it is a question of a, a very very little development work happening if there is some kind of peace in assam today it is because there has been development a little bit of development not much about the other states i cannot say uh, yeah one reason of othering is this uh, cultural and linguistic difference and the way people describe themselves and then also try to understand their relationship with their immediate neighbors or distant neighbors and that understanding itself becomes very problematic i give you an example which is a very startling example uh, bodo women wear a particular kind of a dress called dafna and coach rajbongshi well women also wear a similar is called patani now a case was filed by a bodo gentleman on coach rajbongshis saying that coach rajbongshis have committed a theft by taking away their dafna and turning it into patani a counter case was filed by a coach rajbongshi chap on the bodos saying that our patani has been taken away by you and turned into a dafna and the case is still going on the case was filed in 2008 18 rounds of hearings and arguments and counter arguments have happened before a court of law no in the kokrajhar sadar district court i have been following the court proceedings who really wins is a matter of great anxiety for me because ultimately, yes ultimately it might go to the supreme court as well similarly you can see the relationship between two neighbors now think of a relationship between two distant communities let's say ohomias who live in brahmaputra valley and the adi people who live at least uh, 2000 km away from them how adis perceive about the homias and how homias also perceive about the adis or someone who is living in patkoi hills it's a mutual othering one others the other all the time 
Similar is the situation between Bengalis and Assamese, who are very, very close by, but one perceives the other as somewhat problematic in cultural terms, in linguistic terms. And there's a history of this othering, which has been happening for the last 200 years. And through that, one tries to win a case or a trophy over the other. The instinct is to win over the other, have one upmanship over the other. Between Khasis and Garos, you know, there is a kind of a contest. So there is this contest at one level. At another level, contest becomes a conflict. And that is how the othering, which, is, which cannot be just called an instinct, but it is complicatedly a social construction. And that social construction leads our public discourse. And politicians make best use of it for their own instrumental gain. And that is how othering remains. But in the same way, it doesn't happen on the basis of ethnicity, maybe in Orissa or in Maharashtra or in Punjab. Uh, it, it may not happen in the same way. So there is a specific ground reality in terms of which you have to understand why it happens in the case of Northeast. Uh, I think the answer is simply in terms of number. Um, nobody realizes how small these Northeastern states are. Manipur is the size of South Karnataka. Not even South Karnataka, Tumkur, Bangalore, Mysore, Chaminarjakar is Manipur. In that, in that small little state, 33 different tribes. So imagine the kind of land pressure you have of each of yeah, no, th that's what I'm saying. So you have 33 different types of 33 different ethnicities with 33 different languages, all of them with 33 different cultures. It's such a small state with such l vivid identities, right? And I've always noticed, and I think this is a rule generally, when people are marginalized or are pushed against the wall, it is then that they push back and say, this is me and this is you. It's happened in the South too. We had the, Tam the Dravidian movement when they felt that they were being pushed against the wall. You have the Kannada language movement when Kannadigas felt that they were being pushed against the wall. That only that this is a much larger group, right? The people of the Northeast have always been pushed against the wall, have always been isolated into small spaces. And therefore, the only way, I think, for them to identify themselves is to other from the other. Like the binary, I am me only because I am not you. That's it. And I think that's, that's exactly why it happens. We have learned about the problems of the Northeast. No? I am here. In the opinion of Ghalib, what is the cause of your heart? What is the cause of your heart? I'm asking the seven sisters in the opinion of Ghalib. What is the cause of your heart? Can I ask some yes, questions? Just one uh, small little thing. Actually, in social sciences, we say that no problem has a solution. Even in natural sciences, unless you sort of construct a problem which could be presumptively solved, you know, you construct your frame in that way. In social sciences, we can't frame a problem in that way that you can have a solution. Framing of the problem and problematizing on the problem becomes the most important task in social sciences. Most of us have done that here. Now, you can find out a creative way out. That depends on how good you are at negotiating those problems, how good you are at bringing together all the conflicting parties, which government is not in a position to do. When they take one side of the problem, they totally ignore all other sides of the problem, in case of Northeast. So the problem remains. What about the NGOs and uh, social yeah, social NGOs do play their role, but they also become part of the divisive politics in a certain way. And they cause a lot of lot more problems instead of solving it as well. So, they, they so we can't have a ready solution and a ready solution giver to this problem. So in my view... Uh, can no, I, once again I say, if you come to our part of the world, it is, uh, you will look around you and you will see so many Assamese people coming out for jobs, okay, for very low paid jobs. So jobs are non-existent there. Agriculture, because of erosion, flood and all, agriculture is not a lucrative profession at all. And I think job creation, I'm, I'm at a very basic level now, uh, job creation is one of the ways. And uh, if there are jobs going, people will go back. 
they are not going to stay here and because they have homes and they have fam families there you will find that the rate of young people coming out is huge out migration now is scary and they are coming out for such such low levels of what what we think is i mean why are they coming out for just 7000 8000 rupees and then it's even scarier when you know that that 7000 rupees per month is going to make and make a difference to the family that is scary so i think jobs job creation which uh, not just the government i think we also and then we need peace for that so i think the basic requirement at this point of time is peace and we don't have that very much so that Okay, we have only five minutes, so we'll take one more question. But before that, I think in answer to your question, each of these states are trying to figure out their own... Let's take all the questions yeah. together. Okay, we'll take all the questions and then we'll answer together. But I, uh, just answering that, I think each state is trying to figure out a way for itself. For Nagaland and Mizoram, coming together as Christians has worked. Coming together as a na these militant organizations has worked. So who knows what will work for Assam, who knows what will work for Manipur. We'll have to keep trying, 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 and eventually someday something will work. Other questions, please. Yeah, okay, can I? There's one here, one here. Hello, Palan. Uh, um, uh, I'm uh, Adirudra from uh, Alwas M English. Actually, uh, uh, the real thing is that uh, I would uh, directly say that uh, uh, from this hall of Manipal, it is very difficult for me to imagine how is Manipur or any North is. Uh, but still, uh, well, uh, but who is uh, up to date with the uh, current affairs would surely understand that when our union government says uh, or speaks about development, it excludes North East. And I want to know what is the reason for this othering in your terms itself. Okay. And one thing, and uh, I would uh, actually, uh, and my another question is that, uh, actually, uh, I, I had expected uh, uh, any of the panelists would speak about uh, ASPA, but uh, none, I, I did not hear any allusions to ASPA, so it got me thinking, actually, surprised I am. That is and very specific to Manipur. That's yes, sir. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, but uh, is ASPA, uh, you know, uh, referred or uh, has ASPA you know, uh, affected uh, in any way uh, in in northeastern uh, when it com comes to northeastern uh, literature. I mean, is it reflected? I, I wanted to. Ask. Okay, we'll respond to that. Yeah, in fact, uh, my question is for Mr. Biswas. Uh, considering your academic background, I thought I would ask you ask you this. Uh, you uh, did speak about what you have written about uh, certain. Uh, notions of kindness in certain communities and virtue in certain communities. And you have also written about uh, um, evil. So as uh, you were introduced, so I could make out about evil. Um, we can, of course, always uh, blame the government. We can always consider nation state as evil. And I have no sympathies for the nation state in that sense. Uh, but uh, um, when you look at when you look at evil, so would you would you still consider that evil just lies with the nation state, or or I mean, um, uh, the government, which is the uh, representation, which is the expression of the nation state? Uh, because certain certain kind of of course we are critiquing the jingoistic. Um, fundamentalist religious nationalism, we, we are doing that. But at the same time, certain kind of nationalism is also uh, a product of a process of freedom struggle, freedom struggle which in fact wanted to be inclusive. Perhaps it has failed, of course. Tagore was critical of all kinds of nationalism, that is a different thing. But certain kind of nationalism which intent, intended to be inclusive, Inclusion is also the product of uh, process of freedom, freedom movement, freedom struggle. So, in that, of course, uh, plenty of plenty of mistakes do lie with the government. Undoubtedly, of course, I have no sympathies. But uh, are we? I mean, just putting every blame on the government. Mm, I'm, of course, I'm also playing in a sense devil's advocate in the sense. But are we also uh, simplifying? simplifying uh, our own understanding of the whole whole issue. So in that sense, uh, how do you look at evil? 
mm, how do you look at evil in this whole phenomenon of uh, what we have been discussing? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think one of the most rewarding sessions for me at least for a long time and uh, I don't have words sitting here in, in, in Manipal, I have come to know much about uh, Northeast states, the Indian Northeast states. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, my two, three simple observations and questions. One, uh, as an outsider, it was good to say that an outsider might have a more objective view of the things. Today, what I have heard, the two types of problems that you have talked of, about, one is othering by others, the other is internal othering. Though the lady is advocating uh, the development uh, part of the problem, but I think othering between you guys, you uh, seven states, is much more complex and is required to be addressed on priority. Othering by the nation, that every state is feeling the same way. <laughs> Almost every state, barring one or two states. So that is my first observation. And it's, it's very difficult, to, I mean, to, 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 to fight this phenomena that each state, small state, has against three, four, five, six, seven, or many other uh, sub-castes or sub-tribes. That is one thing. Secondly, I agree with the lady that in order to communicate to the other world in English might be that you are using or you are missing the connect with your own people. Uh, Decolonizing the Mind is a book by, again, uh, Gugi Thiango, And I think we should learn this thing from him. He is one of the celebrated, most celebrated writer of English language. But of late, he decided to write in his Gikui language and then let people or let himself translate it to English. I think when you were asking, the gentleman was asking, for some creative solution. I think this could be the one, that you at least start communicating to each other. Nation is not listening to you, will not listen maybe. But at least you should talk to each other. That is more important from my point of view, and you should do that. Finally, uh, when you talk of Banipur, I know Northeast states because of Ratanthiam. I know Northeast states because of Kanhailal. I know Northeast states because of mime that you are practicing there. I think you should be proud of that too. Thank you. Uh, so we have three big questions. First, um, the reason for the othering, which is the first question that we got. And then uh, you wanted to talk about AFSPA and then uh, Mr. Prasenjit. Sure. Somebody raised the point about the Armed Forces Special Powers Act that was implemented, or rather, what is the word to use? Imposed, Imposed. yeah, very good. Sometimes you run out of words. So uh, it was imposed to basically curb the Naga fight for sovereignty. And it has remained in that region, and now, very interestingly, it's being used by the state government of Assam to circumvent any violence, which may be the outcome of the final, uh, you know, the final outcome of the NRC, which is actually illegal. Now, I once uh, raised this through one of my writings when General V.K. Singh was leading the Indian Army, and he was asked whether AFSPA or whether the army would be used to counter the Maoists in Central and um, Western India. And General V.K. Singh said, we will never use the army to fight our own people. Now listen to that. We will not, not use the army to fight our own people. So I asked in this article, I said, then are the people of the Northeast and other people of Kashmir not your own people because you are using an extraordinary colonial law to suppress your own people. And there are so many deaths that uh, custodial debts due to AFSPA and its imposition. In fact, now, the Supreme Court is hearing these cases. Yeah, those fake encounters. And uh, you, you have complete...
complete immunity because of the AFSPA. You can kill anyone, you can go to anyone's house, you can just pull them out. The AFSPA gives you complete immunity, so you, you commit all your acts of violence with impunity. And then you keep on saying, the, the military keeps on saying, that you can't send us into a conflict zone with our hands tied. So then how do you counter Maoism? So this is the thing about AFSPA, and ironically, it's only the northeastern states and only Kashmir that raises this issue. At one time, we went all around different parts of the country to, to ask people to stand in solidarity to demand the revocation of AFSPA, but it has not happened. The rest of India just doesn't care. Uh, I'll just uh, first talk one or two sentences on AFSPA. You must have heard about Iram Sharmila's name. She was in continuous fast for 16 long years to make Indian state hear that how uh, penalizing, how regressive the implementation of APSPA could be because there, was, there were mass graves found in Nagaland, in Manipur. At the back of a local police station, there will be a mass grave necessarily. Every police station's backyard was a mass grave at some point of time in the Northeast. And Iram Sharmila did this massive hunger strike, yet no one wanted to revoke it. And now in Assam, APSPA has been extended in an illegal manner. United Nations have always termed APSPA as an illegal law because it grants blanket impunity to any officer above Habildar rank who can shoot people on mere suspicion. And that's an attack on our freedom of expression, on our constitutional rights. And that brings the government on the dock. The government being the instru instrument of power and being a representative, elected representative, have this constitutional responsibility of resolving issues, of creating conditions of social harmony and development, which the central government has miserably failed in the last 70 years. And they have created a class of collaborators in the Northeast, a corrupt ruling elite who change their color and jerseys and they come to power and they collaborate with the central government and there are agents who actually channelize informally, we know that there is one person who is based in Assam, who ironically happened to be my classmate. Now he is the main link of all central funding, of legal and illicit funding, both. He is the one who controls all the fund in the Northeast, and everyone goes around him to get the fund. There's a gentleman who is based in Assam. Now this is how central government has created a hierarchy a colonial structure, and many in the Northeast feel that we are, we are as if an internal colony of India, and within Northeast there are internal colonies. For example, people in hills of Manipur will feel that they are internal colony of the plain. People in Barak Valley will feel that they are internal colony of Brahmaputra Valley. Bodos will feel that they are internally colonized by Assamese people. Assamese will feel that they are colonized from every side. Assam has been divided and they have been marginalized. So, so there are these kind of stories of repression and internal colonization in the case of whole of Northeast, for which, once again, the constitutional government has to be put on dock. If we can criticize it, question it, then maybe some sense returns to them. We don't really have any more time. We've come to the end of the session. We will continue these conversations further outside elsewhere over Chai. We did, we do thank you for your suggestions and we do totally believe, I think all four of us do believe that we need to have those conversations between the states, between the communities. Nobody wants the, the situation that is in the Northeast to continue as it is right now. Nobody wants AFSPA. Just because there are no reports about it, don't believe that we're not protesting. Every single day, people are on the roads, getting killed, getting shot at against this, this absolutely inhuman act. So just because uh, media doesn't talk about it doesn't mean it's not happening. All of us have lived those realities. We come from states where these protests are constantly going on. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. And um, as I said, please continue these conversations off the stage also. Thank you. Have a good evening. On behalf of the audience, we'd like to thank the panel and our moderator for enlightening us with the perspectives in the Northeast. And it was an honor to have you here.